Good afternoon, my name is Leah Alexander. Um, I am greeting you from Nashville, Tennessee. I'm uh, thrilled to be on this side of the country for the next couple of days. Um, and I'm happy to share with you a little bit about um, the pit projects that we have happening um, at Meharry Medical College. Slides? Oh, I'm, we've been talking about this clicker all day. Sorry, I'm sorry. I do the slides. Okay, here we go. Um, so just a little bit about Meharry was founded in 1876. Um, Harry is one of two institutions that survived the Flexner Report, so I don't know if people are familiar with the Flexner Report, but it was an attempt to um, sort of establish rigor in medical education, and it really resulted in the closing of all but two of um, institutions where people of color could be trained um, as health professionals and um, doctors. And so studies sort of suggest that had that not happened, we would not be experiencing this disparity that we have um, in healthcare providers. So Meharry, if people know about Meharry, um, we are comprised now of five schools. So it's the medical school, the dental school, graduate school. We have um, a school of applied um, data science and now a new school of global health. And we are primarily known for training um, about 10% of all black doctors, 30% of all black dentists, and about 30% of um, biomedical PhDs. Um, yeah, thank you, yeah. That's certainly noteworthy. Um, so I come to Pitt really because of a suggestion from a college mate and um, colleague. I don't know if you guys know um, Dr. Fallon Wilson, but she sort of reeled me in when she was helping HBCUs to begin to think about what Pitt means to us. And so that's kind of how we landed here. It's very exciting for me. I work in public health, and so public health is very sort of interdisciplinary, um, and it was exciting. And I already know, and we already know at Meharry, that technology is, you know, really driving healthcare. But there are so many disparities and so many um, populations that are sort of left out that it just made sense for us to begin to think about this. So um, our initiative is called Pit for Health, um, and we are focusing on sort of three things. I don't have time to talk about all three, but would love to chat with folks a little bit later. So we have our student-led group. Um, we also do this sort of participatory community uh, mapping using GIS with um, middle schoolers, high schoolers, community folks, which is pretty fun and exciting. Um, and also we have sort of this capacity building program around telehealth, and that's what I want to talk about today. So here's our team. It's a wonderfully sort of interdisciplinary team. We have a sort of a, a city planner, um, a data scientist, an educational um, specialist, and then myself. So what we know about telehealth. Um, COVID really taught us that telehealth can work, and it's worth considering how populations are being engaged in telehealth. And um, we know that there's sort of promise in underserved populations. There is a digital divide, but really, you know, data is showing that people do have phones, right, and have access sometimes um, in the technology that they need to engage in telehealth. The issue is really in our estimation, whether people are ready for it, like whether they see it as a reasonable way to kind of engage in healthcare. And so our project, um, this one in particular, was really designed to sort of address telehealth access equity. Um, so the program that we came up with, we call it um, T2S2, Telehealth Tools for Students and Stakeholders. Um, and so the intervention that we developed, we sort of come up with one session, so an educational session that's delivered by one of our public health students. We've created case examples, so we use our simulation lab at Meharry and our standard patients, those are like actors and people who pretend to be patients that students practice with. Um, and so they've developed some sort of telehealth videos that 
um, community folks can watch. And then we provide this sort of live hands-on experience so that folks can practice. So community practices and our students sort of practice in delivering telehealth. The other piece that we added <laughs> was really to sort of coach community using this intervention. Ask Me 3 is not a new intervention at all, um, and it's just designed to increase patient sort of engagement and care. And so we encourage people to use three questions, right? Ask your doctor, um, what's my problem? What do I need to do? And why is it important for me to do this? Most of our conversations with community um, have been sort of in these face-to-face -face interactions, but we're encouraging our um, community folks to use this while they're engaging in telehealth. Um, so that's it. Look, I got my one minute reminder and I'm done. But this is my call to action. Um, if folks could please connect with us. So you can use that QR code or you can shoot me an email at Pit for Health. Um, and I would just encourage us all to think about how to engage community. We must bring community with us. And even if you're doing the most techie, complicated, crazy, out of the world stuff, you can engage with community and include them in this process and include their thoughts and, and attitudes and, and desires in this process. So let us all just keep up the good work. Thanks. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Kelsey Badger. I am an assistant professor and data librarian at The Ohio State University Libraries. And apropos to the question that we ended up getting um, during our Pitt and Democracy panel, I'm going to talk a little bit um, about the early stages of, of workforce development and the pathways that we present to high school students within the Pitt space. Um, and while many initiatives seek to broaden access to data science, which is the focus of uh, this project, um, our project is unique because it uses spreadsheets um, as a way to lower barriers to integration of data science across the high school curriculum, rather than only in computer science or statistics classrooms. There we go. Uh, so the Data for Healthy Communities project um, is a collection of open educational resources that are designed for use by high school instructors. And it was developed by the fantastic team pictured here um, one of which uh, my colleague Emily Nutwell is out there in the audience as well. Thank you, Emily. Um, and we are really a, a pretty multidisciplinary team here. We have rep representation from education, math, physics, um, and my own field of data librarianship. And crucially, we also partnered with a local high school to both design and pilot our open educational materials. Um, and this was really important because direct engagement with our intended stakeholders helped to make sure that the materials that we were designing would actually be useful in the context of a high school classroom, since the rest of our team was situated within a university. So the purpose of uh, Data for Healthy Communities is to create more on-ramps for data science education in high school. Um, despite the increasing importance of data science across the workforce, high school data science is still often confined within computer science and statistics classrooms, rather than having connections across the other disciplines and courses that students will be exposed to. And the problem with this is really twofold. In our home state of Ohio, um, access to computer science in particular is still pretty unequal. Um, only half of our public high schools have a computer science class. Um, but equally important, the statistic on the other side of that slide, is that a significant number of students are opting out of those classes even when they're offered. So within the 2021-2022 academic year, only about 3.5% of our public high school students took a computer science class. So as a result, um, many students miss out on these early opportunities. And we approached um, these challenges through two key interventions. So first here, we created our educational materials within the context of public health. So topics like environmental justice and social determinants of health can map onto a variety of existing courses from civics to science. Uh, however, key two, it isn't just enough to create these disciplinary mappings. 
because if it still requires coding, there's still substantial barriers. In many states, including Ohio, um, teaching computer science requires additional credentialing, for one. Um, and there is also often a, um, a confidence gap among both the instructors themselves as well as the students. Um, again, see that three and a half percent of students opting into these courses. Um, so teaching with spreadsheets enables a wider number of teachers to make use of the materials and helps mitigate um, that confidence gap. I also want to emphasize here that using spreadsheets doesn't mean a loss of complexity. Um, so the you know, spreadsheet pictured here is one of the core ones that we used in our project. And this is a real world data set with 54 indicators at a local neighborhood level and 300 observations representing Franklin County, Ohio, where we piloted this course. So they worked with a data set of that size after really uh, only a few hours of instruction. And there's an important message here, uh, which is that lowering technological barriers also leaves room for other types of complexity. So one of our learning objectives in Data for Healthy Communities is the ability to analyze decisions and strategies using data as evidence. And to practice this, students were given a case study about a community garden. We discussed the public health benefits of this intervention, from access to healthy food, to community building within a local neighborhood, to improved air quality, um, and then asked them to prepare an argument for why that intervention should be located within a specific local community. And then we gave them real world data within the context of that community and asked them to use that as evidence for their argument. The tricky thing about this is there's not a right answer to that question. We had eight student groups in our pilot of the course and every single one of them picked a different local community using the same data as evidence. Um, and this was not a bug. This was exactly what we had hoped would happen because it helps students to understand that data science is nuanced and that there really is a human element to um, how we use data for decision making within our local communities. But the most exciting result from Data for Healthy Communities was that it increased student confidence. Um, we evaluated the pi pilot course using a pre-post assessment and um, we found a, a big jump in, in self-efficacy, our middle measurement here. So uh, in other words, our students found that they can learn data science, that a new pathway is available to them. And this is a realization that we believe should be available to every high school student, but that's only possible if we create more opportunities for students to be exposed to it. Thank you very much. Well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Marina. I am a full-time law professor and the head of a research center in Brazil. I would like to express how happy am I to be here. I couldn't find a samba robot, but <laughs> since I'm Brazilian, but I found that picture would be very meaningful for you all. So thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity. Today I'm going to talk about a framework for ethics AI committee. There are many different ways to do governance for AI, but we got really deep in ethical committees and we were very inspired by the medical school. So just to give more context, we know that there are a huge impact of AI on the workforce. We see uh, many different reports, 300 million jobs could be affected by the latest wave of AI, says Goldman Sachs. Also, in my field, that is the legal field, 44% 44, 44 of legal work could be automated by AI. I have never seen so many parents asking me, Marina, my, my sons should really go to law school? Are they gonna be jobs in the future? Well, this narrative is not even easy for companies. One example that, that really caught my attention was when Google launched the chatbot Bard that doesn't even exist anymore because now it's Gemini. He gave a wrong answer to the public. So the question is, how can we mitigate 
uh, all the bad things that AI could do, how can we prevail from doing bad things and do good things instead? That's why we decided to design this ethic framework. And I would also uh, refer to the map of innovation for trustworthy AI that Luciano Floridi, that is an Oxford professor, he developed. There is this important three dimensions of this map. The first one is digital governance. Uh, this is the rule of law of every industry, every company. Also, we have digital regulation. Now, in Brazil, we are also discussing how can we regulate AI. We do have our first regulation, strong regulation in the European Union with the AI Act and the digital ethics. That those are the moral problems related to data. Just, uh, so I would like to talk about these moral values. That is where the committees, the ethical committees are uh, located. For example, if I am an industry and I would like to uh, buy computers that are more green, that save energy, there is not really a law that obliges me to do that. So uh, this is a moral evaluation of a company, right? So the ethicals committed are located in those types of, of, of place. So uh, to understand that, we made a group, a research group. We invited people from the judiciary, finance, banks, academy, legal market, NGOs to join the group. We fundraised for that, and we hired four researchers, full-time researchers, PhD, to investigate ethical committees. And we found that uh, we analyzed more than uh, 1,300 articles, but they were all talking about, most of them talking about ethical committee in the medical scenario. So we found only 40 uh, papers that would really analyze uh, ethical committee, and 15 of them were only discussing composition, how they should be uh, with different people, diversity, different backgrounds. So we had to interview uh, 23 uh, industries that actually had those types of companies such as Microsoft, Google, Oran Orange, and uh, the government of Canada as well. So we found a lot of different experience and uh, we found out five important pillars for those committees. The purpose, structures, member, power, and decision making. And so I, we came with this art <laughs> what I call law art, that is a framework that based on those five pillars, there are many important decisions to take. It's an automatic uh, framework. And for example, about the power, uh, should the committee be deliberative, regulatory, advisory? What is the power of this committee? So every decision has many uh, ways to go and many things. So uh, our main findings is that ethical committees are very important to share responsibilities with the CEOs, but also uh, they do struggle about uh, the power they have and, and how, how they, they can make the correct decision when it's not the same what is the business model would like to take the decision but also it is very important to enhance business dynamics with a specialized evaluation for ethical issues. So I would really like to invite you all to know more about this, this work and I'm here to chat with all of you. So thank you very much again for this wonderful opportunity. Hi everyone, I'm Emily York and I would like to talk a little bit about engaging undergraduate STEM students in public interest technology through both pedagogical and institutional innovation. Um, so I wanna highlight in particular how pedagogical and institutional change can really work in tandem and how we can take small steps starting where we are to really make tangible change toward pit workforce development. Um, so I'll share how a new pedagogical strategy in the classroom helped to lay the foundation for establishing a new uh, science, technology, and society futures lab, and then how that lab further helped us create more curricular and institutional change, and now a Pitt UN Network Challenge grant. 
Uh, so a quick note about where I'm at. James Madison University is um, a predominantly undergraduate public R2 university in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. And I teach in the Integrated Science and Technology program, which is uh, ABET accredited as applied science. Students get a broad foundation in science and technology and then concentrate on a particular area. Um, so we try to integrate that curriculum through systems thinking, holistic problem solving, and a two-year capstone research project. Um, so this is the team of uh, some of the people I've been collaborating with in the STS Futures Lab at James Madison and who are also co-PIs on the Pitt UN Network Challenge Grant, uh, Shannon Conley, Tolu Otomosu, and Nadine Plakta. Um, uh, so we're all on kind of the social side, although we have different kind of teaching focuses. Uh, and Tolu Otomosu now is at Morgan State, and so this will be a, a collaboration between JMU and, and I'm sorry, you guys, yeah, Morgan State. So I'm really addressing two kinds of challenges that are highly interrelated around the pedagogical and institutional side. So with respect to teaching, um, the question is how can we make ethical reasoning, responsible innovation, and insights from science and technology studies and PIT um, accessible, engaging, meaningful, and relevant for undergraduate STEM students. And then kind of parallel to that at the institutional level, how can we really increase the visibility and perceived value of research and teaching in the social, ethical, and political dimensions of technology, especially when we're working in STEM spaces, STEM programs and colleges? So in the ISAP program where I am, the social part of the curriculum used to be called social context, and we had no dedicated upper division courses. Um, and students could co-concentrate in it, but they couldn't concentrate in it like they could with the other more technical areas of the curriculum. And we began to realize that as long as social context was figured as the background of science and technology, and as long as we were figured as um, only talking about, let me go back a step, only talking about science and technology rather than offering skills and practices for how to do it well, um, that we're really falling short of our goals, in part because students really want to be doing things and um, not just reading and talking, at least the STEM students that I work with. Um, so this led to Shannon Conley and I developing uh, the CARE approach uh, in the classroom, creative anticipatory ethical reasoning, uh, borrowing from a lot of people, but essentially a hands-on, grounded, and fun blend of scenario analysis, design fiction, and ethical reasoning through which we could cultivate the development of skill sets related to communication, policy, and ethics in ways that would be highly integrated into project-based work. Um, it was actually a couple of students of ours uh, who were doing an autonomous vehicle capstone project and who were interested in ethics and design fiction um, who started referring to their meetings with us as the STS lab that prompted us to really consider, you know, who, who actually gets a lab and why shouldn't we have a lab? Um, as uh, social scientists, especially in science and technology studies, we were maybe enculturated to study labs, maybe embed in them as ethnographers, but not really to have labs of our own. Um, but we thought we should actually reconsider that, uh, especially in the space where we're working with STEM students, that there's also um, both research and pedagogical value to having that kind of a space. Um, and we were also making a lot of messes with these care projects. So we put together a 42-page space proposal for leadership, making the case for an STS Futures Lab. So they said yes. Um, and uh, so what happened next? I, see, I feel like I keep going one ahead of where I want to be. Um, oh, I see. There's a slide missing. Well, I'll tell you what the results are. We got a lab which increased visibility. Um, our colleagues began to recognize and use terms like STS and public interest technology. Uh, the faculty voted to rename social context to public interest technology and science. And more recently this year, they voted also to allow students to concentrate it, in it without the co-concentration. Um, having the lab also helped us get more external funding. And that is external validation that then feeds back into the internal dimensions, right? So there's a circle of, of validation that helps to continue this work. Um, that has allowed us to begin growing the lab, to bring more faculty in, and ultimately to apply to, for this um, public interest uh, network challenge grant. So, um, so this a collaboration again is with um, 
Morgan State, um, where Tolu will be leading that, and we'll bring students together from both JMU and Morgan State uh, for a workshop in pit storytelling. The idea is specifically um, incoming senior STEM students who are likely doing capstone research projects beginning in the senior year. Um, so we want to work with them in a, an intensified workshop format in the summer right before they begin to engage in pit storytelling. We're hoping that that'll make for a nice intervention that will work in the capstone projects, but also um, have tendrils out into the broader faculty. Um, and then we can evaluate that and disseminate some of our insights and findings. So lessons learned. My takeaways are that you don't have to start with the hard stuff. It's really valuable to start with low-hanging fruit, with um, small opportunities, alliances, with colleagues and community partners who already value what we're doing. Space and names really matter, both materially and symbolically. Um, and when you can get a little bit of internal foothold, then you can go for that external funding and you can feed that validation loop. Um, and finally, you don't have to be in an R1 to do really cool things or to have a ton of institutional funding, relatively speaking. Um, you just have to be patient and take small steps. Um, I found it really important to, to not try to be something we're not. I'm not at an R1, so I can't do things that would look like that, but I can lean into the strengths where I'm at, and the strengths at JMU where I'm at are the interdisciplinarity of the program and that focus um, and value of undergraduate teaching. Um, so my call is that I hope that you will take a fresh look at where you're at and think about what kinds of uh, small steps that you could take beginning where you are that can slowly lead toward public interest technology um, workforce development. Thank you.